Robert Miltner. I'm reading the poem Uninhabited World. Our village was all the world we needed. We bred red birds until we could afford babies. At night, our bodies were string beans in a box. You worked so hard your nails cracked while my hands bled from the sharp stones, from the relics I dug from the dirt so we could sow seed in the fields. I set down my hoe when the government forces trampled the oats and planted landmines to explode under the insurgents' feet. While they rounded up goats and ducks and the other young men, we slipped through shadows from our home to a farm shed at the village edge. Do you remember how we awoke to the patch of blue sky in the roof, to the yellow birds nesting in the eaves, to the kick of the army boots and gun butts? We looked like sardines removed from the can. At the refugee camp, we were pea pods and sheep, stripped and shorn. Each morning, I see laden carts pushed toward the open pit over the small hill beyond which the wind goes to die. Last month, I aged a thousand years. This week, another hundred more. Soon the salt will settle on my shadow, cover my bones in lime. I dream my body is a white bird that flies around this beating world. You will know it's me, floating like a kite. I'm the skeleton holding an unsigned poem. Robert Meltner, reading In the Orchard, 1891, after a painting by Edmund Charles Tarbell. What a time we had that afternoon. Four wooden chairs and a table carried outside and set up under dappled shade. Around us, the trees were filled with apples and pears, thrushes and wrens. Everything was a figure in a bright landscape. The women wore their dresses long, with boots laced high. Men picnicked in straw hats, ties, striped coats, and mustaches. It was an era of redheads and brunettes, pomade and parted down the center hair, a world filled with meaningful looks and gestures, a wistfulness of wrists, an erotics of necks. One woman stood, a hand rolled in her apron, the other on her hip. She shifted her weight imperceptibly, and a century changed. From earth tones and pastels, lavender and sienna, to the black and white of zinc photographs, as monochromatic as the motor sound heard coming down the road, spooking the horses which leaped the fence, leaving a rough tear across the known canvas. Robert Miltner Jack Neal and a 49 Hudson. In the last year of the first half of the modern century, Mao, that khaki emperor, was entering Beijing. Salinger was finishing Catcher in the Rye, and Ginsburg was on the roof beginning to howl. 
My father was walking away from the punch press at Republic Steel in Cleveland and driving off, a company man in his first company car, to have lunch in Pittsburgh with a client where they would talk bolts and golf over cocktails and steak. My lace curtain, West Side Irish mother was in her eighth month waddling with me and my year and a half old brother in tow, catching his breath. And in Detroit, 180 miles or so north, a 1949 Hudson was rolling off the automobile assembly line, its odometer at zero, an opened mouth O oh, that marveled at the new highway system that Jack and Neil would drive in it, a postmodern holy trinity going coast to coast, over and over, because they could, because it was not about having or even about being, it was just about moving, their lust for wandering never satisfied, sighs and laughter like exhaust emitted into the air of the high-octane world into which I was being born, gasping for breath. Robert Meltner, reading the poem Blue House for Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo. She was broken. Her piñata had spilled its candy to the floor. She wanted to be whole. He was larger than life, complete of himself. He broke into her life and stole her solitude. Her upper body required it always be held in plaster's hand. She wanted to be held in a wooden frame. His energy was an enormous room where clocks broke and calendars withered and fell to the floor. She was a bed with a looking glass on the ceiling. Art was her mirror. He was every face in the land since before the corn mothers left, every face since the revolution. The light from within her illuminated every canvas she entered. One was coyote, one was monkey, one was hammer, one was scythe, one was clock, one was not. His canvas was history. He was a stele, a stone wall. He painted murals with images that left the margins and took on lives of their own, telling their absolutely necessary stories. She was ceramic figure, fired clay, cracked vase, a blue house. She was the personal pain of the body, the damaged spine. He was the body, crushed by poverty and domination, the burden back, shackle and brand. He was adobe wall. She painted herself as far as the frame. She was art's mirror. He was whole. His piñata was filled with salt. He wanted to be broken. Robert Miltner reading The Arts for Gil Scott Heron. The arts will not be on the test. Math will be on the test because it shows how to count the numbers of homeless people the television won't show helps calibrate how much lead is in the water pipes and not in the pencils, and how to estimate the amount of time needed to react to the media prompt, but not to be the prompt itself. The arts will not be on the test. Science will be on the test because engineering builds equivocations effective enough to justify any hypocrisy. Physics enables occupation to be set in motion without friction and astronomy helps the poor search the sky instead of their empty plates. The arts will not be on the test. A poem has no square root. A song has no chemical compound. A guitar solo will not fit on a bell curve. Dance cannot be reduced to a lowest common denominator. An actor resists dissection, fights being pinned down on cotton. A story has no mean, no mode, no median. 
the arts will not be on the test. There will be no matching columns on truth and beauty, no multiple choice selections on content, no fill-in on form, no short answers on craft, no comprehension questions on aesthetics, no essay on the state of the nation's soul, no none of the above. The arts will not be on the test. Robert Miltner reading the poem, Summer's Ending. An orange beach towel covers a white bathing suited woman, wraps her legs, hoods her head, and allows her to stand facing the afternoon sun. It doesn't stop offshore cold winds. Her sand brown shadow collapses beside the raised hand shielding her eyes from the pale, clear sky. Other bathers gather shells as brush strokes of cirrus clouds tear a sky that won't harm them. On the strand, fallen cottonwood leaves skate over undulations of dunes as if a shifting season's loose change. Out past stands of willow, the land levels, and farmers cut cornstalk for silage. Vintners gather sweet late grapes, and in the orchards, last apples from ground and branch await the cider press. One morning, snow arrives and drifts as if an ocean of white caps, flattening to dun and linen beaches where monochromatic seagulls held aloft by brisk headwinds flap in place like a tied string of origami marionettes. Robert Meltner reading a brief nonfiction, Double Exposure, Part 1. July sunshine strikes the water's surface of the blue hole in Castilia, Ohio. The reflection is as brilliant as lighted candles seen through a crystal wine glass, or a table lamp illuminated bedroom window on a winter's night in northern Ohio, or the light flaring off the lens of a camera that captures a moment. A passing cloud apertures the distinct, vibrant blue hue of the bottomless sinkhole. The water turns as dark as the iris of an eye, turns from wine to the ink to pen this brief memoir of a tourist divertimento for a fidgeting boy, impatient to get to Sandusky on the pencil-thin, sand-and-rock-paved causeway to Cedar Point Amusement Park. Picture the boy's held breath anticipation of the roller coaster's rise, the paused instant at the top from which he sees for a mile or more. Imagine the screaming, plummeting down the first hill and the centrifugal lean into the first curve, his shoulder and hip pressed against the side of the car, the seemingly endless ups and downs, Feel the sudden, cool darkness of the exit tunnel where the brake grabs, rocking the coaster to a stop. Part 2. Autumn leaves float across the small green water pond. They could be aluminum fishing boats seen from the corrugated sheet metal Ford tri-motor airplane looking like a washboard flying in from the 1930s as it cruises low over Lake Erie en route from Port Clinton to South Bass Island, one of the world's shortest air routes. Below, fishermen look up from their bobbers floating on the lake's surface wave from their boats, then take pictures before they're passed over by the shadow of the old plane. 
As the tin goose nears shore, its small windows fill with the faces of its fifteen passengers, who raise their squinting eyes into the dark holes of their cannon and Nikon viewfinders. They hold their breath as the pilot tips the left wing down into descent, landing in a tractor mowed farm field outside Putten Bay, where the aircraft bounces and settles. The passengers deplane and walk to the road they'll follow into, a into town for a day or week of swimming, bar hopping, or visiting Heinemann's winery to descend into the Crystal Cave, the world's largest geode of blue celestite. As they approach the small Quonset hut-like hangar that serves as a terminal, one man notices his split image reflection in a nearby aquamarine pond glinting in the sunshine of early Indian summer. He pauses for a moment, as if posing. Robert Meltner reading A Brief Nonfiction. The death of the fugitive Charles Floyd in a cornfield outside of East Liverpool, Ohio, October 22, 1934. Leaves fall along rows of tree trunks in the late October orchards. The last apples hang, red as the cheeks of pretty girls and boys playing in the first snow of winter. In town, stunted skeletons of bur oak, catalpa, and osage orange irregularly line the waste lots located along the train tracks. Yellow jackets buzz, ready to swarm relentlessly if their underground nests are threatened. The afternoon sun pushes the dark shapes of a brick apartment building and a clapboard car repair garage into square black cells across a rutted alley. Each is as quiet as a mausoleum, empty as a robbed bank vault. Inside one of the rectangular shadows, a man in a wool suit, a tie, and an overcoat stands still. His head is turned slightly. He listens intently for the sound of anyone approaching. He hears a blue jay squawk. hears a crow caw. He catches his breath. The man darts from the small cloak of darkness, and in an instant he is again absorbed into the tentative safety of the next dark rectangle. He releases his breath, listens, checks for his thirty-eight Colt automatic in his pocket, listens again. He knows if he can make it down this alley, past corn stalks standing like rusty bayonets, he'll get to the Ohio River. He knows he's a strong swimmer, the only other thing beyond the colt he can trust. The Ohio River's wide, but he knows there are few currents there to catch him in their nets. On the other side of the river are the ridges and hollows of West Virginia, he trusts in the compassion of poor folk who will take him in, hide him, lie for him. They've heard how, back in Oklahoma, he burned mortgage notes in a bank manager's trash can before he ran to the getaway car with a bag of money in one hand, his pistol in the other. The man hears a crow call, followed by a second one, then a third. Here's a chorus of blue jays grow louder as they fly closer. Here's an automobile backfire. He bolts from the safety of the shadow, exposed as if caught in the spotlight of a police car full of U.S. Marshals packed shoulder to shoulder the way bullets fit into loaded guns. Robert Miltner, reading a flash fiction, Drive My Car. The curve rose from the ribbon of the coastal road, and I told her to hold on. 
All six cylinders of the BMW Z3 purred louder as our speed increased. Her red hair streamed behind her like a silk scarf, her mouth an open circle. She put her hands on the dashboard and began to sing, loud, louder than an approaching cop car, running scales up the musical pyramid toward a high A. I downshifted from fifth to third and leaned the hurling steel mass of the car into the sharp turn, rear tires screaming as they grabbed traction and pushed the redlining engine of the car the way a runner lifts onto his toes to burst into speed. This car had been engineered in Bavaria for grinning curves of road just like this one. I felt simultaneously exhilarated and calm, though it could have been either her or the ecstasy whispering in my ear that seemed to turn into wings as the night air rushed past me like a conch shell over the hammer stirrup and anvil so that the sea roared like a gale. Over the water, the moon was a silver coin I was about to flip, a test of luck in which maybe, just this once, I'd win this toss, after all the times I'd been this close. She put her hand on my hand on the gear shift, the way she'd done at the bar, where I'd met her, as she pushed my fisted dollars back and picked up the tab for the drinks. Together, we downshifted again, and I pushed the gas pedal hard. The centrifugal force pulled our mouths into contorted grins. Guitars wailed on the radio. I saw the green star glint in her eyes and recognized the quick arrival of desire. We threw our hands up like we were kids going downtown on a roller coaster, screaming until there was no air left in our lungs. Thank uh -huh.